Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Cyclical Investors Club YouTube channel. My name is Corey Kramer. Today, we are going to be analyzing Monster Beverage stock. This one came in by request down in the comments section of one of my other videos. If you have a request you'd like me to take a look at, just put it down in the comments. I will get the ticker on the whiteboard behind me. Eventually, I will make a video. I had uh, Google or Alphabet on track for uh, today, next up on the list, but they report earnings here in a couple of days, so I'm going to wait till after earnings come out, and then I'll make that video. Um, as always, this is not individual investing advice. This is just how I analyze stocks. Monster Beverage is a good one to look at because it's pretty straightforward in terms of the factors that you that the, my basic strategy looks at. Now, first, I look at earnings cyclicality. Basically, their earnings have only grown except for during COVID. They had a year where they declined a little bit, but. You can imagine that when people weren't going out of the house very long, trying to see exactly how much the earnings per share fell. Yeah, they fell about, we'll call it 15% for both years combined. Um, but we kind of knew what was going on there. So overall, and then they've those earnings have recovered. So they've already recovered and still growing. So overall, this has been a fantastic secular growth business earnings wise, not particularly cyclical. Although probably not totally immune to you know an economic downturn, overall growth has triumphed. Um, one of the best stocks to have owned over the past twenty years. So I think they changed their name to Monster right around this time. They used to be uh, hmm, some sort of tea company. The name is escaping me. I'll probably think of it after the video is over. Uh, since then, uh, the stock has returned almost nineteen thousand percent. So. I, just a side note, if you, uh, for those folks who are really super attracted to dividend investing, it's worth going back and looking at Monster Beverages record compared to Coca-Cola's during this time. Monster hasn't paid a dividend, so if you had to have a dividend or income, uh, you would have avoided Monster. Now, in the early days, maybe um, you needed to kind of be, you know, paying attention. Monster didn't have too much history. But when we get to the Great Recession, these guys grew earnings through the Great Recession. So if a person was paying attention at that time, you had a stock trading at a pretty reasonable mid teen, we'll call it upper teens PE ratio, growing earnings at double digits right when coke was basically like flat um and if you could have just been paying attention to that and not required a dividend you could have done extremely well now eventually they entered a partnership with coke coke bought part and interest in the business and then monster got distribution i want to say that came along probably right here during this bump so it brought a little bit more recognition i think to the stock in about 2014 that sounds about right and since then it, it kind of traded at a premium after that but yeah overall this has been a fantastic business i would say it's a good one to model if you're trying to figure out what type of growth stock stocks to look for this is what you want to see and you just hopefully want to pay like a reasonable valuation so because we never know how big they're ultimately going to grow. There's been plenty of energy drink companies that did not grow to $52 billion market caps. Um, I mean, and then Red Bull is private, so we don't have information on their earnings growth available. But let's take a look at the recent trend that we have. So I'm going to go back to like 2015 or so. I'm not sure what fast graph should. Yeah, about 13% earnings growth to 14%. That's right what I'm going to use right about what I'm going to use in my estimation. But really what we want to know is one, uh, what is the earnings growth rate? And two, what is the price we are going to pay for earnings? Like what is it trading like the PE ratio slash earnings yield? Well, it trades at a 32 PE, which is pretty expensive. If you watch my videos on growth stocks, really we want to see 20% earnings growth and then assume that's going to be able to grow at like 10 years to pay this PE or at least project that in a couple within a couple years. So we only have 13% earnings growth, the 14% um, already a pretty big company and is trading at that valuation. So we should know right away, even though the business is fantastic, it's pretty expensive. The market's charging quite a bit for it just by looking at it. 
Um, one other additional benefit is these guys don't have any like net debt here. Um, market cap is the same as the total enterprise value essentially. So there are a lot of businesses that aren't tech companies that are in the S&P 500 that can say that. And that's an additional kind of benefit. So there's all sorts of flexibility that that gives them in the future when they don't have to deal with um, any kind of debt right now. So great business, totally worth owning. It's really just <clears throat> about how much you want to pay for it and what type of returns you'd like to get. So going into the spreadsheet here, one of the reasons this is a good example is because we don't have the debt adjustments to make. Uh, the earnings growth rate, I, they probably don't have a lot of buybacks. I didn't double check it, but I'm basically right at the same thing FastCrafts is for earnings per share. This 13% rate, the future is looking, although earnings came in a little slow this year at like 9%. They were, when I updated this for the video, they actually were a little bit lower than expected. Uh, but we're looking at that analysts are thinking like 13% for the next couple years. So there's nothing like off or hard here. Very straightforward. So what we want to know is what are we going to get for a hundred dollars worth of monster um, right now so if you pay a hundred dollars for the stock the earnings yield is 3.33 percent so that's the earnings over the price instead of the price over the earnings it's just the inverse of this pe ratio um and so if you paid a hundred dollars for the business you would earn and you own the whole thing yourself you would earn about three dollars and 33 cents um, for your investment on your $100 investment a year. And then I have that growing at 13 point whatever percent that I said. And I pull that first year's earnings forward. So I assume we would earn $3.77 on our $100 investment. Now what I want to know is if I just collected all that money as an as a owner of the business for 10 years, how much would I collect on my $100? And then what sort of CAGR does that work out to? So if I go down 10 years in the future, I would earn about $70.58 on my $100 investment. So I'd start with 100, end with 170.58. And when you plug that into a Kager calculator, which is what my spreadsheet does, you get a 5.49% 10 year earnings Kager expectation, right? Nothing is written in stone here. So, but if you hit that 13% growth, that's about where you're gonna come out at. This is basically what the S&P 500 is priced at right now. So it's, again, a pretty good one, pretty easy one to analyze, easy one to run the numbers on because there's not really too much to adjust for. There's not much cyclicality. There's not any debt. Um, earnings are relatively steady. The analysts agree about the future earnings. Now they might be wrong, but um, this, when you start seeing, like I track enough stocks that I see this, this is like the midpoint basically of where the S&P 500 is for non-cyclical businesses, which is about, um, in terms of having enough quality and not too much cyclicality, about half of the S&P 500 or maybe 60% of the stocks in the S&P 500 fit that category. And this is about the midpoint of what they're, the market's trading at. So this is basically, if all goes as planned and there's nothing unusual happens, this is the return that you could expect per year over the next 10 years if you pay this price for the S&P 500 potentially or um, just monster stock. Now, if we're talking just the S&P 500, it gets trickier because some of the stocks that are really expensive right now are probably going to be quite cyclical uh, or it definitely could be like NVIDIA, Tesla, um, any of the big chip companies and probably if we had a recession the advertising based businesses like alphabet and meta would get damaged as well so there's probably a lot of cyclicality that is not currently priced into the market the market is pricing in no recession at all i would say um, at least not in the near-term future for the overall market assuming that doesn't happen because the market's kind of short-term looking then this is about what your return would be under those kind of ideal, I wouldn't say ideal conditions, but just average conditions without anything crazy happening. So the invest, an investor has to choose, is this return good enough for me? 
it's probably going to be an inflation protected return because they can pass their costs on the way a bond can't. So the 10 year treasury is at like 4.2 or something right now. Um, so this is a little higher than that and probably inflation protected, but probably would uh, do poorer if there was like a recession or competition rose and things like that. So the risks are different, but you can kind of compare them and see if that makes sense. Now, short term, like floating rate treasuries are at 5%. So it's pretty similar to that, oh, I, th I think over the short term, there's just not a lot of extra value there, evaluation wise. So I wanna buy when this is about 8%. Um, and if I can do that, then I know I have a good chance of getting, usually the returns are way, way better than 8% if you can buy it then. Um, but you get a little margin of safety you try to get really above average returns. So in order to get that 8% level, the stock price needs to fall. When the stock price falls, the amount you make over time from those earnings goes up because you pay less for future earnings. So if the price fell to $32.40, that's when it would hit about that 8% kager. Um, Let's see here, where are we at? 50, so that is about 39% lower than where the stock is trading now. Yeah, that seems pretty reasonable to me. Now, if we have a recession, I use the metrics from 2020 and 2008 and I blended them together because it traded super cheap in 2008. Uh, that didn't real the market just didn't realize how much money these guys were going to make and nobody was really paying attention to them. So that recession PE was pretty low, so I just blended it together with 2020, which I think was probably a little on the high side for a recession. And when I do that, um, the buy price is closer to like $26 a share, so a little bit lower, uh, about 50% off the high. Now, if we do have a recession that affects their earnings, this normal buy price will keep going down with the, as those earnings go down. The recession buy price will stay the same. So it's probably likely if they had a down earnings year that these two would blend together at like 50% off where the stock price is. Now for a buy price with a margin of safety, uh, so that's kind of, and then it, like somewhere in between there would be fair value. Just glancing at it, like $45 a share, if you were like, you really like the business, that would get this up to probably about 6.5% Kager, which is kind of the midpoint of what I would consider like fair value. You could um, come in there with a, and just, you're trying not to have a margin sa safety, you're trying not to get excessive returns. Uh, the benefit is you have a higher likelihood of that price actually occurring. Uh, I wouldn't pay more than that for it. So that 45 would be the most I would pay if I if it was something that I really felt I wanted or I had a bunch of extra cash I was trying to put to work. But I'm really aiming down closer to this like $30-ish level uh, before I would buy because it's a big company now. They aren't going to have as much growth as before but you know the quality's there and you can kind of sleep well at night. When they have no debt, there's only so bad things it could get for them. And there's probably room for some kind of expand, I mean, still growth in the future, even maybe if it's not 13%, maybe it comes in at 8% or 9% or something. So kind of my thinking on Monster Beverage, I'm still watching it, I'd love to buy it if I could get the right price. Um, if you found this video useful, hit the subscribe button and the like button. I also have a free tier on Patreon. Um, definitely check that out if you don't want to rely on the YouTube algorithm to um, get my work in front of you. And there's a $5 tier there. You can request stocks that are not in the S&P 500. If you think my buy prices are way too low and they'll never ever hit, I have a $25 tier on Patreon where I share a stock pick each week and I just I use all my strategies even the ones that are in the full cyclical investors club service I try to find the best value each week and share it whether it's at my best buy price or not so you're going to get something every week <laughs> whether it's at the very best or not I just try to find the best relative values that I can find uh, so check those links out down in the description and I will see everybody later